Welcome to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation CF Education Day webcast, GI Overview, Stomach and Pancreas Problems in Cystic Fibrosis. I'm Leslie Hazel, Director of Patient Resources at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. To hear an update related to CF liver disease, CF-related diabetes, clinical research, and more, please watch an archive webcast on the Foundation's website. This webcast is hosted by the Foundation and supported through an unrestricted educational grant from Genentech. This presentation will answer questions submitted by you, the CF community, related to problems with the stomach and pancreas that are related to cystic fibrosis. Questions not related to the topic or that ask for medical advice will not be asked or answered. I strongly encourage you, if you have additional questions, to talk to the doctors and staff at your CF, CF Foundation Accredited Care Center, or you can contact the Foundation at 800-FIGHT-CF or info at cff.org. Joining me is Dr. Sarah Jane Schwartzberg, a gastroenterologist at Amplett's Children's Hospital at the University of Minnesota. So welcome, Sarah Jane. Thank you. So we know cystic fibrosis causes pancreatic insufficiency where people with CF have to take enzymes when they eat and it causes CF-related diabetes. How else does cystic fibrosis affect the pancreas and the stomach? There are a group of people with CF who are termed pancreatic sufficient CF. And that's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, they comprise about 10 or 15% of the CF population and they are uh, born with their pancreases mostly functioning normally. Mm -hmm. They do have a few small abnormalities of their pancreatic function, but throughout life they might not ever notice it. However, they're at risk for pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. um, pancreatitis is an inflammation of the pancreas, um, and it's a particularly um, devastating inflammation because during pancreatitis, the pancreatic enzymes that are intended to digest your food mm -hmm. can actually become activated within the pancreas, which is abnormal, mm -hmm. and digest the inside of your pancreas. So it's a, it's, a very, um, it's a very difficult inflammation to control, and it occurs only in people who are pancreatic sufficient. So someone actually asked a question. If you're pancreatic sufficient, mm -hmm. will you become pancreatic insufficient, and if you do, is there any way to prevent that? That's a good question. We, we know that a percentage of people who are born pancreatic sufficient will eventually be pancreatic insufficient, mm -hmm. and we think some of them become pancreatic insufficient because of recurrent episodes of pancreatitis. So ideally, if we could show early on in life, um, in early childhood, that some of the episodes of abdominal pain that people with CF were having, these mm -hmm. pancreatic sufficient individuals were having, was due to pancreatitis mm -hmm. instead of gastroenteritis or constipation or any one of the other many things that cause right. abdominal pain. We might be able to stop that, um, those recurrent episodes of pancreatitis and save pancreatic function. But pancreatitis is a very hard disease to control even when we know it's happening. So what are the symptoms of pancreatitis? It's very, very severe abdominal pain, generally above the navel, navel mm -hmm. um, vomiting, and then after that, uh, blood tests that show a rise in amylase and lipase, and imaging studies that show that the pancreas is boggy and inflamed. Mm -hmm. So um, how is this treated? How is pancreatitis treated? Um, really, we uh, don't so much treat pancreatitis as we support the individual until their own body heals. Mm -hmm. uh, pancreatitis makes it pretty impossible for people to drink fluids or eat food, so we provide that to them while their pancreas is settling down and, and, and healing um, and, uh, that, and provide them with pain medication. Uh, but there's very little that we can do directly to stop an episode of pancreatitis. Wow. Um, so another question came in, and I think this is a little not pancreatitis related, but that is, um, so this person says that her child with CF has excessive gas, mm -hmm. you know, and she wants to know, is soda pop bad for a person with CF? Um, 
I would argue that soda pop is probably bad for everybody. <laughs> soda pop has a lot of sugar. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have anything else in the way of useful nutrients and it can cause a lot of cavities. Mm -hmm. But it's probably not what's making her daughter uh, bloated or distended. Um, that may be related to something else. It could be related to small bowel overgrowth mm -hmm. um, or even to gastroparesis, uh, slowing of the emptying of the stomach. Um, both of which are pretty common in cystic fibrosis. So we got a, a lot of questions. Why do I why do I get so bloated? I get mm -hmm. so bloated from one woman that people think I'm pregnant. You know. Mm -hmm. So is this? It could be potentially the small bowel overgrowth or gastroparesis. Mm -hmm. So let's talk yes. a little bit about the um, small bowel overgrowth. Mm -hmm. What is it? Small bowel overgrowth occurs because the bacteria that populate the intestine mm -hmm. um, have a, a, a change in the in the distribution of the type of bacteria. We have these wonderful bacteria in our intestine that actually make some vitamins for us and sort of take up a place in the intestine mm -hmm. so that bad bacteria can't grow in there. Because of repeated antibiotic therapy and because sometimes people with cystic fibrosis have had surgery on their intestines in their in when they're younger, um, bad bacteria can overgrow in the intestine. These bacteria produce gas as they ferment the mm -hmm. food. It's supposed to nourish us, but now it's going to nourish them instead. And that gas creates quite a bit of distension. Mm -hmm. It also can create diarrhea. Uh, you can lose a lot of iron as the bacteria uh, take in the iron in your mm -hmm. body for their own needs. Um, it can make people nauseated. Um, and it can create this sense of bloating and this distension of the abdomen. So um, what other, besides the bloating and the distension and the diarrhea, are there any other symptoms or what's the treatment for small bowel overgrowth? Uh, generally the treatment for small bowel overgrowth is uh, an antibiotic of a class that tends to tamp down these, I call them a thug bacteria, mm -hmm. um, that are in the intestine and sort of allows the, the normal uh, bacteria in the intestine to regain control. Um, and those bacteria, um, those bacteria when they, when they uh, are back in full force can themselves keep the thug bacteria over control, in control. Sometimes in cystic fibrosis, because people with cystic fibrosis absolutely must have certain antibiotics over and over again, mm -hmm it's necessary to treat them time, uh, from time to time for small bowel overgrowth in order to keep them comfortable and keep them from having diarrhea and some of these other problems. Is, is small bowel overgrowth preventable in any way? Uh, no. Well, <laughs> that's good to know. So it's pretty much um, keeping track of what's going on. And so if somebody with CF is having a lot of bloating and mm -hmm. gas, they really need to talk to their doctor about it so it can Absolutely. be investigated. Well, that's good to know. You also talked about gastroparesis. Mm -hmm. What is it? Um, the stomach moves in a particularly uh, patterned way mm -hmm. after we eat to help us empty our food over, say, an hour and a half to two hours after we eat. Um, in many diseases, and, and it appears um, in cystic fibrosis, that pattern emptying becomes much slower. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, your food and the fluid that, that the stomach is secreting is retained in the stomach, sometimes for many, many hours mm -hmm. after eating. Um, the stomach becomes distended. That can cause you a lot of discomfort. Mm -hmm. It can also cause you nausea. And it may end up making you less likely to eat all the calories you're going to need because you're not feeling so good. So, um, you know, you've got nausea, you've got the distension. Is there any potential treatment for gastroparesis or this slower emptying or things that can be done to prevent it? Yes. Um, one thing that we know can prevent gastroparesis is maintaining a healthy blood glucose. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, an important thing to know is that a very high blood glucose can cause gastroparesis all by itself. And that's often reversible when you get the blood glucose mm -hmm. under control. But for people who have gastroparesis and there's no simple explanation for it. Right. Um, eating small frequent meals throughout the day instead of one or two large meals can help your stomach empty more efficiently. And then there are some medications that can be used to help the stomach empty more efficiently. And those would have to be prescribed by a physician.
So I would think if your stomach is slow to empty or in general, I know a lot of people with cystic fibrosis have GERD or gastroesophageal mm -hmm. reflux disease. Yes. I also know people without CF who have that problem. What is GERD and what are the symptoms? Um, after you swallow, the material you swallow goes down to your stomach mm -hmm. and it's not supposed to be able to come back up into your esophagus. In fact, we all have a little bit of what we call reflux every day, mm -hmm. where a little bit of food and acid can pop back up into the esophagus and then it, it's rapidly pushed back down. If that, if that experience of reflux leads to illness, if it causes pain, mm -hmm. which we know as heartburn, if it gets up higher and perhaps gets aspirated down into the lungs and causes um, pneumonia, uh, if it makes us cough, um, any one of these problems, we call it gastroesophageal reflux disease, mm -hmm. because now you have a, uh, a problem that is actually leading to illness. So let's go into how does somebody with CF know when they have these GI symptoms? When should they call their doctor? Um, I think that if you're having a problem that's keeping you from doing things that you want to do, mm -hmm. um, you really should call your doctor and try to get help. But you for sure should call your doctor right away if your pain is becoming so severe that you can't do normal daily activities. Mm -hmm. Or if you have repeated vomiting, um, or if you begin to see blood in your stool or in the material that you're vomiting. I also think a, a fever that you can't explain through your lung disease mm -hmm. is worth calling your doctor about. And then if you're starting to lose weight because you can't eat because of your GI disease, right. I think your CF doctor would want to know right away. So how does uh, somebody who needs to see a gastroenterologist, somebody with CF, how do they find a gastroenterologist who can help them? The first resource I would go to is the CF Center, mm -hmm. because the CF Center is going to know the names of the gastroenterologists who work with them most often and have the most familiarity with CFGI disease. But there's also two other resources. One is the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition um, at www.gastrokids.org. Mm -hmm. um, they have a finding uh, device for finding a, a pediatric gastroenterologist um, anywhere in the country. Um, adults can turn to the American Gastrointestinal Association. They also have a finding tool mm -hmm. that will allow you to find an internal medicine specialist in gastroenterology. Well, that's good to know. The last question, mm -hmm. what research is going on related to the stomach, the pancreas, the GI tract, and cystic fibrosis? I have to say the most exciting research now, both clinically and in the basic science areas, I think is in uh, pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. um, we are learning a lot more about pancreatitis and about chronic pancreatitis, which of course is the form that a person with pancreatic insufficiency might be likely, excuse me, pancreatic sufficiency might be likely to get. Um, those studies are being done clinically, but there's also a lot of research in the genetics mm -hmm of pancreatitis, and I think that's going to, to really improve people's lives in the future. Well, that's good to know. Thank you, Sarah Jane, for giving us some insight into stomach and pancreas problems in cystic fibrosis. You can learn more about pancreatic enzymes and other information about staying healthy with cystic fibrosis on the Foundation's website under Living with C Cystic Fibrosis. You can also read the CF Care Guidelines under Treatments CF care guidelines, and then look in the nutrition and GI section. Many of these care guidelines are also published in the medical journal. This concludes the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation CF Education Day on stomach problems and pancreas problems in cystic fibrosis. I would like to thank you for watching, Sarah Jane for answering the questions and giving us some really good insight, Rick Vasta and the technical crew, Melissa Chin, Genentech, and the CF Foundation for making this webcast possible. Thank you.